Our subject this evening is the neurological disorders. These include Parkinson's disease, stroke, Huntington's disease, and spinal cord injury. These conditions have taught us more about our brain than any other kind of brain disease. Through Parkinson's, we have learned about movement. Through stroke, we have learned about speech. And through spinal cord injuries, we have learned how thoughts give rise to actions. Neurological diseases have been a topic of research for centuries, but only recently have we developed effective treatments. This evening, we will meet a group of scientists who have developed ways to repair or bypass the disordered brain. Well, last time we discussed psychiatric disorders. Today we're going to discuss neurological disorders. These are both disorders of the brain. So one of the first things we want to explore is how do they differ from one another? What's the logic of neurological as compared to psychiatric disorders? Now there are two fundamental differences. One in the nature of the symptoms and two in anatomical location. In terms of symptoms, there is overlap. But from a simplified point of view, you could say that psychiatric disorders deal with enhancements, exaggerations of our everyday life. By contrast, neurology differs in two ways in terms of symptomatology. First, we see fragmentations of symptoms. In Parkinson's disease, we see a dramatic slowing of movement. But in addition, we see the appearance of behaviors that you don't normally see otherwise. Uh, with a lesion of the parietal lobe, we see neglect of a whole side of the body. Just absolutely remarkable, a denial that it's there. But perhaps an even more fundamental distinction is anatomical. We know very little about the anatomical location of psychiatric disorders. It's, it's location, location, location that counts in the brain. And the history of how we localize functions itself is so fascinating. It began in around 1860 with Paul Broca. Paul Broca was interested in disorders of language, the aphasias, and much of what we learned about the early localization of functions came from studies of language disorders. Broca encountered a very interesting patient one day. He had an aphasia, a language difficulty, which took the form of the fact that the patient could not express himself very satisfactorily in language. He could understand language perfectly well, but he couldn't make himself understood. This was not simply a paralysis of the vocal cords. He could hum perfectly well. Moreover, he couldn't write language. He just could not express himself in language. When he died... But he could understand. He could understand perfectly well. When he died and came to autopsy, Broca examined him and found a lesion in the front of the brain. He wanted to talk about this to his colleagues, so he had to give it a name, and in all modesty, he named it after himself, Broca's area. He then encountered eight other patients that had a similar aphasia. They could not express themselves in language, but could understand perfectly well. When they died and came to autopsy, he found invariably they had a lesion in the front of the brain, and invariably the lesion was in the left side. And this caused him to realize one of the major insights we have in the biology of the brain. We speak, he said, with our left hemisphere. The left hemisphere is specialized for speech. This galvanized the scientific community. People began to look for other localizations of functions. And 10 years later, Fritz and Hitzig, two German investigators working on dogs, found that there is a systematic representation of body movements in the surface of the brain called the motor cortex or the motor strip. If you stimulate one part of the motor strip, your face moves. You stimulate another, your, your arm moves. Stimulate another, the leg moves. So there's a systematic representation of your body movement on the surface of the brain. This is extraordinarily exciting. And a few years later, in about 1875, another giant came on the scene, Carl Wernicke, yeah. an extraordinary guy. A couple of years out of medical school, before he was 30 years old, he made a fantastic discovery. He found another language deficit, another aphasia, but this was a difficulty in understanding language, not in expressing it. So this patient could express language perfectly well, but he couldn't understand language. When he came to autopsy, Wernicke examined him and found a lesion not in the front of the brain, but in the back of the brain. But the left hemisphere in the back. In the left hemisphere, but in the back. So again, he had to name it so he could speak to other people about it, and he called this Wernicke's area. area. Right. 
And he said to himself, isn't it interesting? We're dealing with a complex function like language. This is not localized to a single region. This involves at least two regions, one for understanding language and one for expressing it, like a sensory area and a motor area. And when he looked to see where they were located, he realized that the Wernicke area, the area he had worked on, was at the back of the brain. This is where sensory information comes in. So when Understanding is where the sensory information comes exactly. in. Exactly. So information from reading or hearing feeds in from the back of the brain into the auditory cortex and the visual cortex. These two areas converge onto Ver Wernicke's areas and put that visual information and auditory information in a code for understanding language. He also knew there was a connecting pathway called the arcuate fasciculus that went from Wernicke's area to Broca's area. So the information goes from the sensory areas to Wernicke's area, from Wernicke's area through the arcuate fasciculus to Broca's area. Now what kind of connection is that? This is a pathway, an Just anatomical a path pathway. Right, so I, I think following on from what Eric said, um, the study of neurological diseases um, is important for two related reasons. One is that they help us gain insight into how the normal brain is put together. Because in everyday life, our behavior seems so seamless, so easy. It's not until we have an injury to the brain that we suddenly see how, in fact, this seamless behavior is made up of component pieces. Um, and so we can gain insight into those components and how they're actually organized in the brain in neurological disease. And then the second related area is that by studying neurological diseases, we can get insight into treatment. Um, so I'd like to sort of give two examples um, of the kind of insights we can gain from studying neurological patients. And I'm going to use this brain as an example. A big debate raged in the 19th century between two camps. One camp that thought that brain function was divided up into localized components, and another camp that thought the brain did everything holistically. Right? And interestingly, that debate goes on today. But um, and the reason for this debate was because it all depended what kind of disease you decided to study. So, for example, if you get a stroke in this motor strip here, um, you develop a paralysis in the limbs on the opposite side of the body. But otherwise, you're okay. You think okay, your language is okay, it's just the limb on the opposite side of the body that is affected. So that was a very strong case for highly localized function. But there are other kinds of lesion that caused a much more diffuse, broad set of abnormalities, which made it very difficult to believe that all of those could be actually controlled by one region. So, for example, you can get something called neglect, especially when you affect the right side of the brain and you get the inferior part of what's called the parietal lobule. And these patients, they have great difficulty orienting, attending, and acting to stimuli in one half of visual space or in the, on one half of their body, in this particular case, the left side. So, for example, if you touch them after this lesion here on their left side, you ask them, where are you touching them? They'll say, my right. Um, when you walk into the room from the left, yeah. They'll go, hello, and turn their head to the right. Okay? So profound cognitive problems caused by a fairly focal lesion. So in other words, in some cases, the processing is very local, and you get a very focal effect. And that's why some people thought that it was all very localized. And in another case, you have a focal lesion that has diffuse effects because of a knock-on effects to other regions, and you get a more global abnormality. And so you can see, by continuing to study patients with imaging techniques that allow us to see this architecture, we can actually learn fundamental principles about how the brain is put together. And one of the uh most important thing, I think, in relevant to Parkinson's was the understanding that the basal ganglia, which were depleted of dopamine, uh, were doing something more than just uh, providing some substrate for movement. Uh, in fact, it was commonly believed at that time that the basal ganglia were primarily movement because of the association with disturbances of movement and basal ganglia dysfunction. Uh, we were able to show that, in fact, it was a restricted part of the basal ganglia that were really uh, involved with movement and that other regions were involved with higher function. The key to finding, uh, this, understanding the mechanism of this was actually to lesion, to destroy a small part of the motor circuit within the basal ganglia. And this is a, a region called the subthalamic nucleus. Uh, the details are not so important, but this is Malin's discovery. Was it was just a fantastic advance to realize that this area, which is by and large neglected in the basal ganglia, had a central role in the control of movement and in Parkinson's disease. And that's what led you 
really to start thinking about using deep brain stimulation for that basic fruit fly. So the fruit fly was really used and developed as an experimental organism by Thomas Hunt Morgan at Columbia University and he was interested in basic aspects of chromosomes and heredity. Later Seymour Benzer sort of he opened up the the world of the brain and the fly and he focused on genes that were involved in behavior. And just like Meilung talked about, there's regions of the brain that are isolated, but they also connect to other regions of the brain. Genes don't work on their own, but genes work in a network with other genes. And these are called gene pathways. So in fact, we now know that for many processes, not only genes, but entire gene pathways are shared between flies and humans. So that means that we can then take that gene and study it and ask how it may be functioning and hope to learn not only about flies, but really what we're interested in, <laughs> we're interested in people, in humans, right. And so this, the fly had been classically used to approach <coughs> development, um, and then it's, more recently, it's become very popular for behavior, and we decided, well, why not try with human disease? So um, the idea would be that whereas these diseases in humans can take decades for their onset, in flies, we can give a fly a phenocopy or what it looks like to have Parkinson's disease in days to weeks. So we, can, so we can grow many flies and we can speed up the whole process in order to really study that mechanism. Anthony, so we developed an electrode array that is instead of one, we, we, uh, a, a tiny implant of many electrodes that's shown on this slide. Uh, it's actually something about the size of a baby aspirin. It's implanted permanently in the arm area of the motor cortex, and then it comes outside and, and the signals are brought to the outside in its current version. So it's very tiny, just not even the size of a penny. But at that point, we said, well, here we have technology that allows us to peer into the brain. We have uh, an understanding, at least a, a primitive understanding, of what that part of the brain, the arm area of the motor cortex, is trying to do. We could, in fact, take people who are paralyzed, that is, able to think about movement but not able to move and connect their brain back up to the outside world. What is also so wonderful about this is not only the clinical uh, effect which is so dramatic but it really shows that John has learned how to read the brain, how to use the information from the brain to drive a device. So that itself is a major insight that you can make sense out of the action potential sequences in the brain. But more strikingly, and I think uh, remarkably for uh, disorders that really uh, are psychiatric uh, in nature, such as obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, depression, and a Tourette syndrome, which is a blend of movement and uh, psychiatric uh, disturbance. So I think the theme here is that we, we stimulate the motor circuit for movement disorders, we stimulate this emotional uh, reward circuit for treating these psychiatric disorders, and uh, it seems to be more circuit-specific than disease-specific. So we use the same targets, the same stimulation uh, parameters for all of these conditions, uh, granted that this is fairly uh, large-scale uh, kind of there's, stimulation. There's, a, there's an interesting sociological point here, uh, Melan, and that is that Helen Mayberg, whom you had in this program recently, introduced deep brain stimulation for depression simulating this right. area 25 that she had found hyperactive. And here is a psychiatric illness that was treated successfully by a neurologist. And why is this so? Why <laughs> weren't psychiatrists doing this? And that is the culture, the two fields are different. Yep. Neurologists intrinsically, from Broca and Wernicke on, have thought of anatomy, 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 location, location, location. And psychiatrists right. have not thought in anatomical terms until just recently. The main thing, Charlie, I would say about this technique uh, is that it really has given renewed hope Enormous. for patients uh, with psychiatric and neurologic uh, disorders. What I always like to do at the conclusion of these conversations is, is, to, is to ask the one question, is that, is that what is the thing that that you most, the question that you most like to see answered, to see the realization of what you're 
talking about? Uh, well, th this has a whole set of problems. Currently, our patients have a plug on their head. They have a cable going to a big rack of computers. Yeah. And we have the mystery of actually what the brain is doing. So I have the problem of wanting to know what the brain is actually doing, not what it's, we think it's doing. I want to be able to make a device that will be hidden inside the body, much like a cochlear implant or a right, cardiac right. pacemaker. And I want to take this big chunk of computers and shrink them down to something you might wear like an iPhone in your pocket. <laughs> So, so those are those are our problems. What question do you most want answered? So, if you come from the point of view that I do, which is to look at a really simple system, what you're seeing is emphasized are the similarities and not the differences among different diseases. So we can model different diseases in the fly, but they look more similar than different. And so our idea that we're going after is that there might be common gene networks that underlie multiple different diseases. And if there are, then it means there might be gene nodes that we could attack for therapeutics. And so we'd like to identify those gene networks that might tie multiple different diseases so that we can go after those in a therapeutic sense. John? Yeah, so I, I, I have a comment and a dream. The comment is I think that I think the great message that this show can put out is that Neuro, the nervous system and neurological disease and neuroscience seems to benefit greatly from multi-level explanation. We've had genes, proteins, receptors, exactly. neurotransmitters, right. yeah. and I think that's not just about taste, even though Eric made the very great point that psychiatrists and neurologists seem to have their own preferred level of entry into understanding, but the profound point is, is we need to attack all these levels and have research attacking all these levels and then having everyone interact. So that's my main comment. I think that's a very profound thing about biolo biology versus physics, for example. Alan? Uh, my real question is kind of where I started this business. Uh, I, I was trying to understand the basal ganglia. Right. Uh, I, I do not understand the basal ganglia. Uh, I understand how they can cause all kinds of problems when they don't work uh, and how we can help uh, with that, with these ways of modulating activity. But I think we really don't understand exactly what they're doing. And I think the evidence is pointing more and more towards something we talked about, which is plasticity and learning. And I think uh, this probably will be a more important and profitable uh, venture than trying to figure out what we've been studying to this point. And uh, it's a long, it's a big topic, but that's, that's what I th where I think uh, the answers will be. My colleague. I would like to see the kinds of logic we've heard tonight around this table applied more extensively to psychiatry. I think psychiatry is lacking in emphasis on anatomy, on how different regions function electrophysiologically, and I think that kind of thinking needs to happen on a routine basis. And one of the things we were discussing before we came in here is to what degree ought to be a common training for neurologists and psychiatrists, at least for the first several years of their career. 